At first, it seemed as if children were immune to SARS-CoV-2. It was just adults who had to worry about getting sick, but at least their kids were safe. But were they? As schools reopened after lockdowns, it became clear that children could not only carry, but also spread the virus. Then came the variants, and with them, a rapid rise of infections among younger children, with some getting seriously ill. More children are being admitted to hospital than before. So are the new virus variants making kids sicker? Or are simply more children being infected than before? That is awful. Yeah, that's not pleasant. I'm doing that every day. Oh, well, well, welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin. And schools here are currently closed for the Easter holidays. That means kids can't catch the virus there, at least for the next two weeks. But what about meeting friends or family? And how big is the risk for children anywhere? Well, here's what we know so far. Das große Coronavirus und er geht. In der Mitte ist der Rund, grün und da zum Kind. Ich bin ja ein Kind. Meine Kinder kriegen auch Corona, aber ich nicht. Ich kriege nichts noch. Kids and the coronavirus. It's supposedly harmless for them. But is that true? A year after the pandemic struck, hospitals are reporting an increasing number of young admissions. They're suffering from the so-called Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome, or PIMS. Worldwide, doctors have seen this condition emerge weeks after a COVID-19 infection. The WHO keeps track of the severe illness in children and young people, but says it's rare. Luckily, children and adolescents tend to have more mild disease, and even most children tend to have asymptomatic infection, which means they don't have any symptoms at all. But since most children are asymptomatic, it's hard to know when they're infected, so the virus is transmitted easily. Often, it's completely undetected, as some studies show. We examined children for antibodies against the coronavirus, and we found that around six times as many children had had the infection as would have been expected. This study shows us that children definitely do get infected and that they can take the infection home with them. So far, nurseries and schools haven't been seen as COVID hotspots, but that may be about to change. Virus mutations like the B117 variant, which emerged in the UK, are far more contagious amongst children as well. Scientists want to apply the same strict hygiene measures to them as for adults. The same rules, smaller groups, social distancing, hygiene, ventilation should apply there too, just like everywhere else, because children also contribute to the spread of the infection. And because the coronavirus does pose a serious threat to some children, vaccines are needed. Pharma giants Pfizer and Moderna have begun clinical studies in the U.S., some on babies as young as six months. But with initial results not expected before summer, it'll be some time before a safe vaccine is available for children. And for more, I'm joined by Yvonne Maldonado. She's an epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist at Stanford School of Medicine. And she joins us from Palo Alto in California. Good morning to you. Good to have you with us. Uh, please tell me, how worried are you about the rise in infection numbers among children? Uh, yes, it is a concern, but we have to remember that it is still a case that worldwide that children do not make up a very large percentage of people who are infected with the virus. For example, here in the United States, about 13 percent of all infections are in children under 18. It is true, however, that children can be infected. They can become hospitalized. Um, and rarely uh, children can die from the disease, so we do have to be careful. And in addition, as you heard before, uh, children can become infected more likely without symptoms so they can spread to others. Right. Right. We have to remember that all our family members must mask and distance. Right. How big a role does the so-called British variant B117 play when it comes to children? 
Well, the B117 variant is going to play a similar role in children as it will in any other age group, and that is this virus is more infectious. So uh, whatever we see infect, uh, infections uh, in children, we're going to see more, maybe 30 to 50 percent more infectiousness of that virus in children as well as in adults. But so, does it also uh, make them sicker? To see it, those surging. Does it also make them sicker because uh, we, we see more children hospitalized now? Yeah, we don't know that that's the case just for children. We have seen data from the from Europe that the B117 does seem to cause more severe illness, but most of those data came from adults. We don't know yet about children. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't seen enough data there. All right. Now, I know that you and your colleagues uh, are working on a COVID-19 vaccine suitable for children. How will that vaccine differ from the ones already available for adults? Well, um, we know that Pfizer, uh, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson will be using their vaccines for children. Uh, we're going to be starting in another few weeks uh, to use the Pfizer vaccine here at Stanford, and then maybe Johnson & Johnson after that. And Moderna is also st starting their trials. The doses will be starting off with smaller doses to see if they uh, produce uh, any allergic reactions, for example, and safe, make sure that they're safe. And then if they are, the, dose, the dosing will be increased potentially to the same level as what adults are receiving. And uh, there's a different timeline, I understand, for uh, adolescents and uh, for smaller children. Uh, could you just briefly tell us when we can expect the vaccine for adolescents and then in particular for, for toddlers and perhaps even babies? Yes, uh, so Pfizer vaccine here in the United States received uh, emergency approval for 16 and 17 year olds. So we uh, we imagine that uh, for Moderna and Johnson and Johnson, there may be um, approval for 16 and 17 year olds for their vaccines, hopefully by this fall. But for younger children, that is those say 12 to 15 and five to 12, it may take longer, uh, maybe later this fall. Certainly for the little ones, six months of age to two years, we don't expect vaccine will be available. Although trials will be going on this year, we probably won't see any available approvals until 2022. Right. I mean, I, I know that it's a bit of a nasty question, but do we actually need a vaccine for children, given that the WHO stresses that most children infected with the coronavirus are asymptomatic? Well, you know, there are 130 million uh, uh, births a year in this world, and um, we know that children are a big proportion of our family members. They can go out of the house and become infected. So we think that children are as important as adults in being protected for their own health, as well as for prevention of transmitting this virus in households in all around the world. So yes, absolutely, it is critical that children become uh, vaccinated, but we need the vaccines to be as safe and effective as possible. And, and just briefly, in the meantime, what's your advice for worried parents? Yes, I think uh, the same advice should hold true now as it did a year ago. Uh, if uh, We know that uh, children should be uh, monitored for safety, again, at, uh, among not uh, going out in crowds, uh, making sure that children can wear masks. Children over two years old can easily wear masks. They're very safe in, in, the, in two, mm. two years and above. And distancing and hand hygiene are still important right. in that age group as well. All right. Yvonne Maldonado from Stanford School of Medicine, thank you so much. Thank you very much. May I ask you a question? Did you catch cold this winter? Come down with the flu? No? Well, over to Derek and one of your questions now. What happened with flu in the 2021 winter season? A huge fear going into this winter in the Northern Hemisphere was potentially having to deal with, with waves of COVID and flu at the same time. This sort of dreaded twindemic that would put healthcare systems under even more pressure. And, and one of the most positive things you can say about how things actually developed is that those fears never materialized. In fact, a flu infections worldwide have fallen so far during the pandemic that it's kind of hard to find the right adjective to describe the trend. It's staggering, maybe. Uh, look at this graphic on the topic from the WHO for a minute. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the numbers of confirmed cases of flu back in early 2020. 
When those lockdowns happened everywhere back in March and April, the numbers nosedived and they've remained at truly historic lows ever since. Most experts think this dramatic drop is due largely to measures like mask wearing and, and, and social distancing implemented during the pandemic. Um, but I can hear you saying, well, if those measures worked so well against flu viruses, why have they proven so much less effective against SARS-CoV-2? At least part of the reason could be that influenza viruses were already endemic on a global scale, sort of migrating, if you can really use that term with a virus, uh, between the northern and southern hemispheres in a, in a regular winter season rhythm. So when COVID-19 hit a year ago, lots of people had some immunity to the flu because they'd had it fairly recently. Then another significant slice of the population has since acquired some immunity from flu vaccines. Uh, many scientists have theorized that, that throwing social distancing and frequent hand washing and masks into that mix possibly put flu viruses over a, a critical transmission threshold, one where they, they simply can't spread effectively. But even today, relatively few people globally have acquired any protection from SARS-CoV-2 through infection or vaccination. So it can spread effectively. Um, at least that's the working hypothesis. and a significant turnaround for the country, which at one point had the highest death rate in the world. Take a seat, please. Thank you. Thank you. The United Kingdom says it's already administered at least one dose of its COVID vaccine to over 30 million people. That's close to 60% of the adult population. Uh, we leave you with these pictures. Thanks for watching.